this is not the video I wanted to be shooting this morning. I got up this morning and I was all happy. I'm like, I'm gonna get up at 4.30 in the morning. I'm gonna go crawl out in my mobile. It's steaming cold outside. I'm gonna set up my tripod, my little handy cam. Little handy cam, I'm gonna go put it in my mobile on its tripod. I'm gonna hook up my fancy ass little lapel microphone. I'm gonna start shooting the install videos that you guys have all been waiting on. I've been waiting to do them. I don't know what it is, man. It has been like impossible to get anything here or anything else. I got a roll of coax. Let me tell you the story. I got a roll of coax that has taken four weeks to go from here to my friend in Georgia. I mean, it's a big roll of coax, don't get me wrong. It's five foot across, 300 pounds, but we're going on like a month and a half. My, my customer's starting to think I'm over here smoking the ganja or something, or you know, tooting on a crack pipe or something, you know, trying to chase Mary Jane down the street or some shit. I don't know. <sighs> Said so, Hugh, back on topic here. I had this uh, old body this old body sweet 16 here just got dropped on me the other day this thing's in really 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 good shape for what it is and um, it just fell out the sky and it's got the old school with the big fans that move a ton of air that you can't even buy any more fan kits that go with it that's right you can go get the newer fan kit but the fans are half the thickness and they move a third the air. So it's got the old big bodied fan kit on it. Now we're gonna, we'll clean the little smooch off of it here and a little smooch off of it here. Have faith, this thing will look like new. And it showed up here with all the parts in it. And my buddy down there in Arizona said, man, shoot a video of this real quick and sell it. I said, I, I, I can't, I got other stuff I gotta get done. Thinking, I'm a mobile, cause I got, I got a trip I got to take here pretty quick. I got a bunch of stuff getting ready to stack up, and I'm going to get real busy here real fast, you guys. And he's like, no, nah, no, nah, just shoot a video real quick and offload it for us. Let's get, let's get this out of the way. I'm like, but brah, I don't, I don't have time for, I, okay. So we're going to spend a little bit of time today, and we're going to repill this guy. There's no transistors in this. And uh, it was disassembled by a guy that's not a complete hack job, so that means all the traces are still in place and the solder work isn't teabag. Um, we're going to throw eight transistors in here. We're going to go through, we're going to check our bias resistors, which are like half watt instead of like the 16th of a watt. So check this out. Look at this resistor. It's big boy. And normally they're like a 16th of a watt or quarter watt or whatever actually real deal resistors. Um, this thing's never been burned up. So there's not a lot of scorch marks to, and I don't have to go in here and change nothing except for maybe this tuner right here. I'm going to have to readjust it. But it's old school, baby. This is the way they used to be made back when people cared and quality control was high and parts weren't, you know, just kind of slapped together. So um, they had all the bias bypassed in this thing. So that's why I got to go back and check each one of these resistors and then put the bias circuit back into working order on this. Um, you know, that's an old school trick. You know that, right? You guys, you go in here and you, you bypass, well, we'll use this board for example. What the, really, really focus. You, uh, they take one of these ferrite beads got a wire going through it and they'll move it from they'll move it from this connection over to a ground source and that puts the amp at class C which makes it pull a little less current but makes it completely an op for sideband so what I got to go do is I got to move this back over to here but I've got to check this first because if these are damaged in any way that's going to throw the input voltage that gets applied to this transformer way out of whack like way out of whack and it'll have a chance of damaging the transistors. We are going to go ahead and we're going to put HGs in it, brand new 16 DO8s, brand new. 
they're right in here in this little care package. And uh, we're going to see what we get for end results. Pretty straightforward, I think. But this is what I'm doing with my morning. Because I thought I was going to start on my install video and the main port of that video that I got to get started on, at least for step one, which I'm going to do the antennas. I got the headliner out of my truck. I got everything. I'm, I'm sitting here waiting on um, acoustic mat to show up. Um, I've got this stuff that's um, it's a special kind of glue. It's a rubber-based RV roof sealant epoxy that is flexible. I'm waiting for it to show up. I'm waiting for everything to show up. And then to add insult to injury, I go to see if my metal shop's open so I can at least get the plate that I need to reinforce the roof of my truck for the puck. And my metal shop's closed for inventory today. So it's like, you know what, piss on this. I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna rebuild this suite, and I got a 10 pill over here I'm working on, and I'm just gonna go focus on those projects for today. So I'm gonna do this, and then I gotta go focus on a 10 pill that I'm building for you all to look at. And uh, we'll try this again tomorrow. So maybe tomorrow, by tomorrow night, we'll have a new install video. But for today, we are gonna finish ripping this thing apart. Um, we're going to get the transistors down and we're going to get a new power wire distribution network put in this thing and we're going to get it all put back together and it's for sale and it's going to go to one of you guys. Well, <clears throat> we got all the transistors in here, but it looks horrible because of all the flux. Now, back in the 90s and the 80s when they were making these things real heavily, they, um, they used this solder that had just a ton of flux residue. Now, it does not change the functionality of the amp, but aesthetically it's not very pleasing to look at. So, now what we're going to do is we're going to give it a bath. We're going to take 91% isopropic alcohol, and we're going to douche this thing with that, and it'll dissolve all of the flux, that's all this brown schmoo that's all over on the inside of the box. It'll, it'll clean all that up. It's not going to change the functionality of the amp whatsoever. I mean, technically, all I'd really have to do is put a distribution network here, give it a ground, and give it some power wire. That's all we got left to do. Hook it up and run it on video. But it won't look that good. And if people are going to pay the money that people are willing to pay for these old body, you know, suites like this, I've got to make sure that I do my due diligence on my side of the street to make it look pretty. So let's. Uh, this is a before, and I'm going to keep the camera kind of framed in the same way. And when we come back here in just a second, we're going to show you after. See what I'm saying? Looks like a whole different amp when it's not all covered with brown schmoo and snot. So, like I was saying, now all we got to do is put a strain relief in the ass end here, create a distribution bar across the back, hook up all our positive leads, connect our ground wires. And the other thing I couldn't stand about this was this was somebody's cute idea of the actual way to hook this up. This is a 50 amp Anderson clip. This is a fire risk. This is woefully inadequate. Let me go over here. Let me move this. Let me grab this. At a bare minimum, we would use one of these. That is 175 or 150 amp Anderson clip. You see the size difference? 
in an ideal world, you'd want to use like the 300 amp, but we're going to go with this one just for uh, compatibility with a lot of people's electrical systems. We're going to use this connector if, if you do anything. We're going to use bare wire here today. This is a testing, but I'll throw that on if somebody wants it. It's that simple. So let's go ahead and let's get some power wires installed in this thing. And let's make it red and pretty. We're going to put lipstick on a pig. Okay. So we went ahead and we did a um, power wire upgrade to it. We used four gauge coming out the back and that's to help promote the really kind of help promote the idea that we need to get more bigger batter power wire coming from our battery up to our amplifier. And if I put four gauge on it, I quietly pray that maybe the end user will go, ah, I should use four gauge. A couple hundred amps moving over 15 or 20 feet. You need four gauge to really carry the load. Just saying. Over here, we have 1,000 watt slug in peak, 1,000 in bird average, 5 watt slug in reverse, back from the bird 10,000 watt dummy load. We're using our ICOM 7300 as a talkback radio at the moment. We're using the D-Rail Striker 955 as our drive radio. And over here, our spectrum analyzer is set up from zero megahertz to 256 megahertz. So first, let's shoot our principal. We'll turn the amp off. That is just the radio all by itself. We're at negative 50 dB. That's our noise floor. And as we can see, there's no transient signals whatsoever. Let's turn our amp on. Once again, two tiny little side harmonics. And they're at negative 40. So we're way down, 40 and below. So we're not even concerned with it. Hello, what do you want to? It's really not all that bad. Really clean. So let's come over here and let's see what we're doing. So first we're gonna show you radio drive. Hello. One, two, one, two, one, two. About 100 watts. 100 watts in. Hello. Just burying it off the scale. Hello. Audio. And is this thing still pulling current when I unkey? Nope. Okay. Hello. Audio. One, two. Still pulling current, so it's staying locked up. Okay, let's figure out what's causing that problem. Come on, stop. Sorry, I didn't mean to hit the stop record button. So what we're talking about is this. We're watching our amp gauge down here. And also in turn, out of the corner of my eye, I'm looking down here and I'm watching this relay latch. Well, this relay, all it does is switch the bias on and off, which also in turn drives this relay. And this relay is sticking. Now, how that would present to most technicians, they'd be like, well, why does it keep burning up pills? So let me show you what I mean. We'll key this real quick. Still staying keyed and it's pulling current. How it translates to affecting the amp is this relay is staying latched. Either it can be from a 12 volt leak signal coming from this relay, which I don't believe since I'm physically seeing the armatures move, or this relay is staying latched. 
It's either because it's a little bit out of tune and there's causing some kind of harmonics that's keeping the field energized on the relay. And it's staying, the bias load is staying on the transistors. About 36 amps worth of load, the transistors are sitting there trying to work but with no input signal, which is typical of an oscillation. So we double tap the microphone real quick and it goes away. So that tells me we need to adjust this capacitor here. So let's see if we can get this problem to go away by simply tuning our input tune a little differently. I don't want to, want to. Nope, still staying latched. Let me zoom out a little bit more here and so you can follow along in the problem solving department. We're keeping an eye on this. We're not over here concerned about this watt meter. We're keeping an eye on this because this is showing us our amperage. This is our voltage on the workbench. This is how much current we're drawing. 30 amps. I quick key it again. Relay on keys. 30 amps. On key. So is this a mechanical issue with the relay, or is this a tuning issue? Let's add a ton more capacitance to it. Hello, one, two, one, two, okay. Just about a half a watt of input relay. And it's still doing it. So it's not a tuning issue. I believe it might be a relay malfunction, which wouldn't surprise me. We've seen this before. Hmm. Let me dig around on this for a minute. Let's figure out what we figure out. Okay, so you can't hide from a voltmeter, right? So I go and I hook the voltmeter up and I'm watching how much voltage is actually going to this relay. I added a couple capacitors to it to um, help snub out any AC that might be somehow magically getting on the line and that wasn't the problem. The problem was at this relay. It was showing me a solid 14 volts from here to case with the voltmeter. So I went, all right, this relay's only job for the most part is to switch the bias on and off. Or yeah, switch the bias on and off, which what I mean by switch the bias on and off is it sends a 12 volt signal over that gets picked up here and run and drives this relay. This relay is the one that does all the antenna switching and all that kind of stuff. Okay, I'm like, well, this is my circuit, but my bias circuit, but in a different layout. It's just physically laid out differently in the cabinet. So I thought, well, let's very carefully take the case off the relay and um, let's key it a couple times and see if it stays latched up. It did, and I just took my finger and went and touched it and it quit. And I went, okay. So my problem's here. So I went in with this very special tool. Um, this is called a varnishing tool. Uh, you can buy this off of Amazon and eBay. I got this a million years ago. This is probably a 15 year old tool, 20 year old tool. Uh, the GC9337 is the tool you need to clean this relay contact. So I went in and I polished up those contacts. <clears throat> and now what we've got going on coming right up underneath amperage, pardon me, it's coming right up underneath amperage and then falling right off. So now 
our input tune, let's go up here. This is our 955, that's a five watt slug in reverse. Hello, one, two, one, two. Hello, audio. Hello, audio. Let's go take a look at the front of the striker. Hello, one, two, one, two. It's happy. And our amp gauge, because now let's not forget, we've got our sideband activated. So we'll key it, unkey it, and the sideband delay is holding the relay shut. That's the bias staying on for a little bit longer. It's working perfectly. Looks good on the spectrum. Looks good on reflag. I got confidence in this. Simple, easy problem. Now, last thing is I went and replaced these transistors, checked all the 1.8 ohm resistors. This one was within spec. Small problem. It was minus a 10 ohm resistor here. I didn't catch that, so that's my fault. And two, the 10 ohm resistor that was over here on this side was a dead short. So it was taking 100% of whatever we had going on here to ground. So the first time I keyed it, it took this 1.8 ohm resistor and sent it up in smoke. And in turn also blew that one resistor completely up. But for a short, brief nanosecond, there was a little bit of 12 volt current that was hit these two transistors. So I've yet to test these. I would only assume that they are bad. Went ahead and put two brand new transistors in there, two brand new 10 ohmers in there, a brand new 1.8 ohm resistor, and everything balanced out. So, a little small problem overcome. No big deal. So with 100 watts of drive, making that thing disappear off the end of the scale. Reach in here, we'll flip it up to 2x. Let's go on down in, let's take a closer look at it. I'm guessing probably 12 to 1300 watts. On this scale, now that we're in 2x, 1,000 watts is directly between the uh, 40 and the 60, which would be the 50 mark. Every major hash mark after that is an additional 200. Hello, one, two, 1,200 watts, dead on the money. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's drive it on up. We'll go ahead and we'll disconnect the derail striker here. Come on, pan out. Flip down. Get rid of the derail striker, which is a good radio. We're going to hook up our 490, which does about 130, 140 watts. We'll see if we can get a little bit more out of it than this. Hello, audio. So 14 and some change. About 1450. Hello, audio. Hello, audio. About 14 on the button. That's by going up 35 watts of drive. See what we sound like coming out the talkback radio. Hello, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Audio, one, two, one, two, one, two. Hello, come in. Hello, audio, one, two. Hello, audio. Samp is done. We're just standing here shaking each other's hands back and forth. This thing is done. This amplifier will never produce. See, now it's hot. It's finally, we finally got it hot, so we got to let it cool down. This LED indicates when the fan kit, the stock fan, sh fan kit, should come on. This one right here. If we manage to get this thermal couple, or this thyristor, or whatever the hell it is, I've always called it a thermal couple. I'm probably wrong in my electrical terminology. It is a heat activated switch. When the contact surface of that switch gets hot enough, it opens up and that's the auto circuit that allows the fan to turn on the stock configuration. 
The way we've wired this one is the smart way. We turn the amp on, the fans turn on, and the fans will stay on, giving us the coolest operation at all times. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put the relay cover on it, and we're going to put the outside tins on it, and we're going to let it cool down because I've been sitting here hammering on it with no error. Let's see, the amp is at about 120 degrees on a heat sink. The sandstone is 132. Inside guts of the amplifier, about 112. Right at the thermal switch, about 105, roughly. Says the fancy dancy thermal imaging heat gun. Woo, woo. All right, let's put the tin on it. Lap seal. Lap sealant is what I was trying to say earlier. A special kind of rubberized glue that I want to use to seal the cross member supports on my new Suburban and the roof. I want to add lap seal in between the posts, the rib supports for the roof. So I want to go and I want to lay down uh, like hush mat or uh, dynamat, that kind of stuff. Then I'm going to lay down a foam covering over the top of that for heat density. For heat density. And then on all the ribs, I'm going to insert lap seal. Lap seal is this incredibly sticky rubberized substance that just bonds to whatever it touches. And once it cures, man, that, that's what they use to seal up the top of RVs and stuff. It's a really good bonding agent. Anyhow, that just popped in my brain. That was from the very beginning segments of this video. It's all done, needless to say. Um, I got the tins on it, and I went to slap the plugs in it, and I went kathunk, and stuck the plug in, and the top set of fans turned on, the bottoms didn't. Oh, that sucks. So I unplug everything, and I pull this plug out, and I plug this one in the bottom. The bottom fans now work. So I plug the one that was in the bottom back in the top, and I start turning the plug. All of a sudden, the top fan starts working, the bottom fans don't. We've seen this before. If we were to cut this molded, blow molded plastic plug apart, we'd find that one of the wires that makes up the conductors, either it be the ground wire, which this is actually a little mini coax that's in here, the shield wire or the center conductor have broken off the plug. Well, I just went over and I grabbed a couple more mono jacks because I accidentally bought like 10 bags of these. I got this problem when I get on Amazon. Sometimes I'll go buy things off Amazon, like I just need like one or two, and I don't look at the quantity that I'm buying. So I've got about 150 of these mono plugs, and what I was wanting to buy was stereo plugs. I know, I'm a fool, yo. So I ended up buying 10 bags of 20 per bag. So I got 200 of these, roughly. I thought, well, I got the plugs at least, because I'm a moron, you know. And um, I rebuilt the Y splitter for this thing. And then I extended them a little bit so the wires wouldn't be so tight. So you can go ahead and mount this up any way you want to. I personally like to take a zip tie and zip tie it right to the grill on the side of the amp. But we're going to leave that free for you, the new owner of this thing, whatever you want. And uh, yeah. Top bottom fans work great. It's moving a ton of air, enough to get the job done, at least the girls that I go dancing with. So, we'll put oh, 120 watts of drive into it. Hello, oh, audio, and that's on a 2x scale. So with 120 watts of drive, hello, oh, audio, 1212. Hello, 1212, we're getting 1400 watts, nice and even and smooth. Hello, oh, audio, 1212. This thing runs perfectly. So you guys that have got a 200 watt radio on down to a 100 watt radio or an even lower, you can run this with like a 35 watt radio and get four or 500 watts and you don't have to worry about key down time. This is your entertainment vessel. 
Um, this is the hard part. This is when I say how much it's worth. For us to be able to make any money on this one, we're going to be into this for about 1200 bucks plus the ride. So you're going to be looking about probably 13 and some change, depending on where you're at in the country. It's worth it. It's old school, old school all the way around. It's got all the little knick-knack paddy whacks give the dogs a bone in it. If I was to give this a rating, I would say that this would be about a 9.5 out of 10 as far as quality. So first one to text me or call me, whatnot, this, this video is probably not going to be able to come out until late this evening. So I will be present and accountable this evening. And uh, as soon as this thing hits the interboobler, I'll be waiting for somebody's phone call. Gentlemen, my name is BBI. And I appreciate every single one of you guys. I'll go work on this 10 pill the rest of the night. I'll see ya. Bye-bye.